Well, uh, this morning we continue to just celebrate everything that God's doing through baptism, through giving, and now through the Word of God. Uh, As I was reflecting just a little bit this morning, uh, or for this morning, uh, I was thinking back to when I started in full-time ministry. I started as a youth pastor, and I remember uh, interviewing for my very first position. Now, I got this interview in a season where there weren't a lot of ministry jobs open, even fewer for people fresh out of college with no full-time experience. Uh, And so I went into this uh, interview a little bit desperate. Uh, By a little bit desperate, I mean a lot desperate, okay? And I don't know, maybe they could even smell it on me. I was that desperate, and I needed this to work out. I knew this is what I wanted. Uh, I didn't give it a whole lot of thought beyond what I wanted, and so I was determined to get this job. And so how I was determined was by choosing to, to filter all of the questions as I was going into this interview, I, I determined I was going to filter every one of their questions through the filter, what do they want to hear? Some of you are laughing because you know that's a surefire way to fail at whatever you're about to do, is just to do everything everybody else wants of you. So I, uh, I did that, and I got the job. Uh, not quite a year into it, I realized this was a mistake. And, uh, you know, I landed in that spot because I forced it. I made something happen. I had it in my mind, like, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is what I want to do, so I got to make it happen. And I did. Sometimes when we do that sort of a thing, we realize that's not the right thing. That's not good. And so uh, just after a year, I found myself looking for a new job to try to transition out of that current position I was in. Now, everything in me leading up to this moment said, hey, just slow down, wait, you don't need to be desperate. Yet I pressed through anyway. And I realized in that moment that we as human beings have an incredible amount of ability to make things happen, even good things, even some good things. Now, there's a saying that uh, many of you are, are probably familiar with, that the world is what you make of it. Have you heard that before? The world is what you make of it. But but the question is, is this true? I I think uh, maybe in light of what we talked about, if you were here last week, we talked about um, some of of the things we have control over, some of the things we don't have control over. And, And one of the things we have control over is our choice, but can we really control things in the world? Now, some of the things we can control to a certain extent. I could control uh, this, this job offer to the extent that I could say what people wanted me to say in order to get in. But I didn't have control over what they chose to do with that. Uh, some of us, I think on, on a certain level, like maybe if we just describe it in general, we, we might have a certain amount of control over our success in the world. We, we have a certain ability to produce success in our lives. But the question is then, at what cost? And then there's some of the most important things in life that we really don't have any sort of ability to make happen. Think of it. Can you make somebody love you? Even if you could, would it be good? Do you have control and do you have ability to make somebody forgive you Or to change the past and pretend like everything that's happened to you or the failures in your own life are just gone. You and I can't make those things happen. Things like love and trust, things like forgiveness and hope, we can't make those things happen. No amount of human effort can produce those in our lives, but they are some of the best things in the world. Yet we still have a role in each and every one of these things. Each and every hope, each and every desire in life, we may not have control, we may not have ability to make it happen, but we do have a certain level of responsibility with it, in it, for it. So the question is then, where is the line between making something happen, pressing into it when maybe it isn't good and still having some sort of response? Where's the line between forcing something and being faithful in something? I want to ask you to turn with me to Luke chapter 1 as we find out the good news of God's word to us today. 
So we've been looking at a lot of characters around Jesus, a lot of characters of Christmas. Uh, In the life of Jesus, we started out with Zechariah, uh, who was married to Mary's cousin. We're about to read about Mary, the mother of Jesus. Um, We we read about Zechariah and Elizabeth, and we read about, uh, last week we read about Joseph, and this week we get to read about Jesus' mother, Mary. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. Uh, It's going to be on the screen above you, above me, really. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. We have an incredibly significant moment, not just in the life of Mary, but in the life of all the world's history. It's a significant turning point. Uh, We read at the beginning of this uh, kind of a little context setting us up for the story that we're about to read. It's a, a, a bit of the context that's touched on here in verse 26, and also one that's talked about later in verse 36. It's in the sixth sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. So we read in the story that Mary is the cousin of Elizabeth. We talked about her a couple of weeks ago. And Elizabeth, we read, is in her sixth month of pregnancy. Now, Elizabeth was not able to have children. She was barren. She's never been able to have children. And when the word of God through the angel Gabriel came to her and told her that, uh, told her husband really, Zechariah, that they were going to have kids, that there were a couple of limitations against Zechariah, if you remember. First is that they were barren, they weren't able to have any kids at all for their whole life. And secondly, even if God were to have changed that, they were well beyond birthing years. They were very old, uh, the story says. And so now we, we come into this context of understanding not only did she get pregnant, but she's six months along, quite a while. And in Elizabeth's own story, we heard that she was in seclusion for five of those months right after she became pregnant. So this is a very short uh, period of time since we've left off with the story of Elizabeth. This is when the angel comes and visits Mary. This is when the angel Gabriel comes and talks to Mary. So we read in this time period, in Elizabeth's pregnancy, six months along, God sends the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. Now, there's not a lot of words for city in Scripture. What the literal translation here would say, a city of Nazareth, but it's actually uh, the city of Nazareth, but it's actually really important for us to understand that they didn't have a lot of terminology for big city or small village. And if you don't catch it, you won't understand a, a little bit of Mary's response here in a moment. This town of Nazareth is a little bit even of an overstatement. Uh, Nazareth was the nothing of nothing, okay? It was, uh, it was a place you drive through on the way to get somewhere. Now, no, um, no disrespect to, this, to the state of Indiana, but when we lived in Michigan, our joke about Indiana is, why do you go to Indiana? Their motto is that you have to drive through us to get somewhere else. That's essentially Nazareth. You had to drive through them to get somewhere else. That's the only reason you would really go through. There, there wasn't through it. There's, there's not a whole lot there. But that's where we read that um, the angel Gabriel is sent to a virgin, to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. So, first thing we find out about uh, Mary is that she's a virgin. She's never been with a man. She's never had sex with anybody. So, 
uh, Gabriel sent to Mary, who's a virgin. She's pure, she's been saved, and she's pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. Now, if you remember, and you were here last week, we talked about the difference between being pledged to be married to somebody and being engaged to be married to somebody as we would know it today. Our engagement period is a time looking forward to something that will be fulfilled, and pretty much the engagement period, there's not a whole lot going on other than a a pre-commitment to each other and a whole lot of planning and stress until the ceremony, right? But pledging was a little bit different. It wasn't an engagement period where you looked forward to the marriage. It was, in and of itself, essentially marriage. The only difference was the man and wife lived in separate dwellings. She still lived with her parents, And at the ceremony, that's when he would take her into his own home. But for all practical purposes, a pledge to be married is being married in the ancient Near East, in in the New Testament times. So we read that uh, she's still a virgin, so her and Joseph haven't consummated anything yet. Uh, She's pledged to be married to Joseph, so they could. And that David himself is is a descendant, or Joseph himself is a descendant of David. Now, David was... This is referring to King David, uh, the second king in Israel, one of the greatest kings of Israel, and the most faithful king of Israel, a king who had received the promise that he would never lack somebody because of his own faithfulness that would sit on the throne over Israel forever. So what we have here is an indicator about the type of person Mary is, the state of her marriage, and the kind of person her husband is. He's of the kingly lineage. He's, He's royalty But the problem is, the king currently on the throne was put there by Rome because Rome rules everything at this point. Rome rules the entire settled world for most practical purposes, and that includes Israel. Now, the king sitting on the throne of Israel is a guy named Herod, and he's kind of a puppet king. He's been put there because he'll be more faithful to Rome than he will be to Israel. You getting the picture? That's what's going on, and it's this context in which Uh, Mary is visited by the angel Gabriel. When the angel meets her, in verse 28, we read, he says, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Now, angels have showed up to a lot of people in Scripture. And without fail, the people are scared. They're startled. Maybe they're scared because out of nowhere this being appears, or uh, maybe it's because it's an angel. I don't know. But at any rate, the people are always scared, but this time it's a little bit different. This time, the angel speaks to Mary, and Mary has an interesting response. Mary was greatly troubled by these words. The, The words greatly troubled doesn't mean fear. It means she's perplexed and concerned about this greeting. What what kind of greeting is this? I'm highly favored? Mary was greatly perplexed. She was disturbed and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. You see, the angel visits Mary, who is very young. She has made no name for herself. She's done nothing of notoriety, and she's not from a place of notoriety. So Mary is wondering, what does it mean that the Lord favors me? I don't understand this. But Gabriel continues talking to kind of clarify. Maybe he could see the the concern in her face. Maybe Mary had one of those faces where it doesn't hide a whole lot. Uh, But the angel's picking up on something. He's like, well, I got to explain a little bit more. So he says, "Uh, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Now, the word favor is actually the word grace. Okay, It it doesn't mean favorite, as if Mary is somehow God's favorite person in the whole world at this time. Mary is the person on whom God's grace rests. Now, grace, essentially, is God's movement toward us and his making us able ability. Does that make sense? So when God gives grace to somebody, it makes somebody able to do something they weren't able to do before. God's grace makes us able to do that which only God can do through us. Grace, essentially, when God's grace rests on somebody, it's a decision-making point. Every time you look at grace coming on somebody, there's a response to grace that is necessary. That's what the angel is speaking. That's what Mary is hearing. She's hearing 
The angel of the Lord say to her, God's grace is on you. It is time to make a decision in light of what God wants to do in you, Mary. This is a big deal. This is not Mary hearing, uh, God loves me more than anybody else. This is Mary hearing, something's about to happen. Something significant is about to go on. In the midst of somebody who feels very insignificant, something significant is about to happen. As the angel continues to talk, he says, you are, will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great <clears throat> and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end. Now, there's something about the quality of the language here that communicates the immediacy of what's happening. Okay? We, we need to catch that. What the angel is talking about, you will conceive, it's in the here and now sort of context. It's an immediate, this, this is it, you are, you're pregnant. <laughs> you're getting pregnant. This is going to happen to you, and what's about to happen to you is that you're going to have a child, he's going to be a son, you're going to name him Jesus. Now, last week we talked about when, when somebody is named in Scripture, it, it's an incredibly significant uh, it, it's, it's a significant moment. It means something more than just they have a name. That, that's a, usually a turning point in redemptive history. There's, there's something important about what this person will do, whether it's a name for a baby or it's a renaming of somebody. In just a moment, we read that this child will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. Jacob, in the story of Scripture, is somebody who had his name changed. He went from Jacob to Israel. Jacob was the father of all the tribes of Israel. His kids, literally, their names are the tribes of Israel. And so there's something significant happening when God changes a name or names somebody. And here he names Jesus, which means God will save or God saves. It's about the type of person this baby would be. So the angel says, he's, you're, gonna, you're giving birth? You're, you're pregnant, you're going to call him Jesus, and he will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Now, now remember, Mary's betrothed, she's pledged to a guy named Joseph who is from the kingly lineage of David. So there's a certain amount of this that makes sense to Mary. She's thinking, well, that's great, because if he wasn't of the lineage of David, I'd be a little bit concerned. His dad comes from the line of David. That, that makes sense, right? But then the angel continues on and he says he's going to reign over Jacob's descendants. That's all the people of Israel. And his kingdom will never end. This, this is different now. There's something extra happening in the story. There's something a little bit beyond the surface. There's something a little bit more that Mary needs to grasp because this isn't just going to be any kind of king. This is going to be kind of a forever king. Now the language here of, of kingly, uh, lineage and, and all of that reigning over, uh, over Israel and, and David's throne continuing. M Mary grasped that. That's part of her history. She was used to kings coming and kings going. But there's a difference now. Herod's on the throne, and her child is now going to have a claim to that. And, and more than that, he's supposed to sit on that throne forever. Uh, kings come and kings go. K kings are kind of temporary. But this one's going to be different. This is a different sort of child. So Mary is, is starting to take all of this in, and she's thinking, okay, the angel tells me I'm basically pregnant now. <laughs> this, this is happening, but, her, but he's also saying that, that the baby's dad, Joseph, because the line of David, it, it, like, it's supposed to happen that way, but we haven't slept together yet. Mary's not an idiot. She knows how babies are made. And so she starts to get a little bit concerned about the whole process of this all. Uh, so the angel comes on the scene, and he, he tells Mary what's going to happen. But Mary is really confused about the how this is going to happen. So she responds to the angel in verse 34, and she says, How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. Now, at this point, Mary's made a few assumptions. She's assumed that because of the immediacy of the angel's language, because Joseph, her spouse, is of the kingly lineage and that she's pregnant now, 
She, she's a little bit confused and making some assumptions that this baby is going to come through natural means. Again, the, the angel shows up and he makes a promise. That's the what of the promise, but the how Mary's a little unclear on, and she starts assuming some things about this. Now, I don't know if you've ever made assumptions about anybody. There's other sayings about what assumptions make us, right? Uh, assumptions aren't always safe to make. Because assumptions are based on how we understand things to work, or at least how we've experienced them to work in our past. I've made some assumptions about people before. In my role as a, a leader in the church, I've, I've had a lot of people reject me. And they reject me for all sorts of reasons. They reject me maybe because I've said something that they didn't like. Um, sometimes that's because God's word can sometimes be a little bit offensive. Sometimes that's because I'm offensive. <laughs> Uh, Sometimes it's just because I'm not somebody's style. I'm not their cup of tea. And so they walk away from me. Now, I've had other moments in my life when people have walked away from me in relationship or I've sensed distance in the relationship. And my assumption is, oh, man, I've done something wrong. I I gotta fix this relationship. But as I try to press into it, as I try to figure it out, I, I've realized some things. It's, it's not always something I've done. My assumption is I've caused a riff in a relationship, but sometimes what I've realized is there's other things going on in that person's life. Yes, there is distance in the relationship. One of the things I've learned that creates distance is shame in somebody else's life. If there's shame in your life, you don't want to be known. And if I want to get to know you, our tendency is then to put distance now, in that, in that moment, I, I have to be careful not to make an assumption that I've done something because I'll start to interact with a person or I'll start to assume things about myself even that aren't true because that's the information I have to go on. That's, that's how I'm used to things working. Mary's in the position where she's also making assumptions about how things work. She heard the what of the promise and she makes assumptions about the how of the promise. How will this be? I'm a virgin. I've never slept with anybody. I, I get that's his dad. That's going to be his dad. Joseph's the father. But how how is this going to happen? The angel continues on and tells her the how. The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. The first half of the angel's explanation. This is the how it's going to happen. The angel says a couple of significant things. The first one is, uh, is, is about the Holy Spirit coming upon Mary, and then that the Holy Spirit will overshadow her with his power. Now, there's a couple of things because uh, I think our culture's gotten a little confused through some fictional writings and through some other speculations about what's going on here. We're not, um, we're not perpetuating in this part of the story some kind of Greek mythology where the, gra- where the gods sleep with humans and have demigods. Okay, that's, that's not what's going on here. Uh, the angel is not saying that God is going to come down and impregnate Mary the way humans do. You see, there's a couple of terms here that we need to understand uh, in order to really truly grasp the power of what's going on. And the first one is that the Holy Spirit will come upon Mary. Now, that's not a physical, sexual coming upon. That is a, a reference that we've heard many times over Scripture. Usually, as you read through the Old Testament of Scripture, uh, there's many times where the Holy Spirit comes upon somebody. That person is usually a prophet or a deliverer for Israel. As the Holy Spirit would come upon a prophet, it would enable them, it would be God's grace to them to be able to speak his word and, and either foretell something that's going to happen in Israel or to bring God's people back into alignment or to communicate something from him to the people. That's what happened when the Spirit of God came upon the prophets. They worked in miraculous ways. Now, uh, that's, that's what's being referenced here. Now, there's also judges Uh, or deliverers for God's people throughout the Old Testament. And when the Holy Spirit came on them, they didn't necessarily always speak on behalf of God, but they acted on behalf of God. That's that's what the whole book of Judges is about, that the, the judge is in the place and time when God is going to use that person. And that person has the Holy Spirit come upon them, and they are able to do things they weren't able to do before. That's God's grace to them. That's the language that we have here with Mary. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon Mary to enable something that wasn't able to happen before. Now, the second part of the Holy Spirit here is that the power of the Most High will overshadow you. 
This, again, is not some kind of a reference to something that's going to happen physically with Mary. This takes us all the way back to Genesis 1, in the beginning, in creation, when the earth was formless and void, and the only thing that was happening was there was a lump of chaos, and the Spirit of God is hovering over the deep. He's hovering over the chaos. He's brooding like a hen over her eggs, getting ready to cause life to happen. That's the picture that we have here of the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary, coming upon her to make her able to do something she wasn't able to do and hovering over her, causing life to happen. This isn't about a sexual relationship. This is about a miraculous, creative work of God in the womb of Mary. Our understanding and our confession as a church is that Mary was, uh, was a virgin from the, from the moment we, we read about her in the story until she delivers Jesus as a baby. We read in the story of her and Joseph that they didn't come together, they didn't lay together, they didn't consummate their marriage until after Jesus was born. This is a miraculous work. This is a creative miracle in the life of Mary. Now, to give a little bit of proof, uh, the angel talks about Elizabeth. We, are, we already talked about Elizabeth, but uh, at this point, we, we realize that Mary didn't know about Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth is having a child, so the, the angel says, Mary, if, if you don't really believe this, take this as a sign. Elizabeth herself, the one who couldn't have children, she's six months along. She's about to give birth. It's coming soon. And then one of the most profound statements in this whole passage is is spoken by the angel, for no word from God will ever fail. That means every word from God is a promise. Mary makes some assumptions. She starts wondering about how all this is going to work out. She hears the promise of God and is concerned about how it's carried out, and the angel speaks to Mary, and and he says to her, no word from God will ever fail. That's how. Because if God promises something, he will carry it out until it's done. Mary makes the assumption that if this is God's promise to her, she has to go figure it out. But if she's already pregnant, she can't go get pregnant. How is this all going to work? And the angel speaks to her and says, it's not on you. The outcome of this, this is in God's hands. If God makes a promise, and when he makes a promise, no word from God can fail, he will deliver on his promise. So the angel redirects Mary and he says, listen, this was the promise of God and whether you can understand how it works out or not, you need to believe that it will work out because this is God's doing. The same God who hovered over the chaos of the world and ordered it and formed it into something with order and beauty. The same God is taking the chaos of our lives and he's ordering it and making it beautiful. That's the promise of God. And Mary, you need to understand, no word from God will fail. And then the next most beautiful lines of this whole passage are in Mary's response in verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. May your word to me be fulfilled. A couple weeks ago, we read about Zechariah. He has an angel stand next to the altar while he's in the temple offering incense and prayer before the Lord, and he gets scared, and and the angel gives him a promise. And when the angel gives him a promise, he says, "Uh, you're going to have to give me a sign. I don't understand how this can work. I'm too old, and we've never been able to have kids. And the sign to him was that he couldn't speak because he didn't believe. His response to the angel was, I'm... Nah, I don't think this is going to work out. (laughs) You're going to have to prove it. But Mary's response is, here I am. May it be. Just as you've spoken, may it be so in my life. Mary rests into the promise of God. She sees all that he wants to do in her life, and she says, I'm here. This puts Mary an insignificant woman from an insignificant town in not just an important kingly lineage, but an important faith lineage. She stands among the spiritual giants who hear the word of God in their life and respond in faith. As you say, let's go. 
If God said it, I'm going to believe it. It's going to be on him to determine because I, I can't make any determinations about that. So Mary takes her place with some of the, the giants of faith in the redemptive history of Scripture. As you've spoken it, may it be so. And then the angel leaves her. This is, this is Mary's story. This is a story that communicates something to us. Mary could have looked at her whole life and, and she did have a question to the angel. She, she did have some assumptions about how things worked. It seemed too impossible to, to Mary to be able to grasp hold of. But Mary's story teaches us this. With God, nothing is impossible. Mary's story teaches us that with God, nothing is impossible. We have limitations. We can't move beyond those limitations. We have ability and lack of ability. God has no lack of ability. We can push certain things through, but there are other things that we cannot. There is no way Mary could have made this happen and still remained everything that she was in that moment. There was no way Mary could stay in her current state and push this forward. It had to be God's doing. God had to be a God of the impossible. Now, I think there's a lot of us who look at a lot of circumstances in our life and we think that's impossible. And I think Mary would come to us and speak the words into our ear and say, it's okay. God's a God of the impossible. Whatever that impossibility is for you this morning, we want to be able to step into and respond to a God of the impossible. There's a great many things in our lives we can't make happen. There's, we can produce a lot. We can make a lot of things happen, but there's a lot of things we can't make happen, but God can we might not understand the how. We might not understand how we get from here to there, but God knows. God knows how to get you from here to there, though it might seem impossible for you. You might start, like me, making some assumptions about how we get from here to there, but you need to hear the word of the God, uh, the word of God to you that his word will never fail. Now, there are some ways that you and I can step into this understanding uh, uh, of experiencing the God of the impossible, that though our circumstances, though elements of our lives seem impossible, they seem out of reach, they seem like too much, we can accept what God has for us, this God of the impossible. The first thing I want to encourage you is that you need to, you need to find the promises of God. That's step one. Look for the promise. Now, uh, just a, a little caution here. While every word from God is a promise and every promise from God, every word of God will never fail, when I'm talking about looking for a promise, I'm not just assuming something on God. You see, if we assume something on God, that's actually not God's promise. That's our assumption that God will work a specific way in our lives and then we hold him to that outcome. Uh, that's more like practicing magic and thinking about God as a genie than understanding a promise from God. God is not a genie to give you whatever you want, whenever you want, because you assume God's word never fails in that area. Scripture is filled with promises from God. Some of those promises are timeless in the sense that they are applicable to all people at all times, everywhere, equally. And then there are promises that are timeless because no word from God ever fails, but they're not promises to us. There was an incredible uh, season in the church in the 90s with the rise of something called the prayer of Jabez. Now, Jabez was an insignificant footnote in the Old Testament, uh, and he had a prayer of enlarge my tents. And because God responded a certain way, Christians everywhere were saying, saying great, God, enlarge my tents. Now, that's a wonderful act of faith, but that wasn't God's promise to you and me. It was his promise to Jabez. We can't take things that aren't promises to you and me and make them promises to you and me. 
We have to be discerning as we look for a promise from Scripture. We have to find the promises that are for you and me. And here's generically the promises that we understand from Scripture, that Jesus is restoring and ruling over all things. What is the promise from our passage today? That Jesus will rule and reign over all of God's people forever. That means he is over all. He's over every failure that we've ever had. He's over every way people have failed us, every way they've betrayed us, every hurt, every illness, over every disease. He's over every cancer. He's over every headache. He's over every need. He's going to rule and reign. That's the promise we have. We know that the promise of Scripture is that Jesus has come to restore all things and set all things right. Those are the promises that we have. If we're going to look for a promise, we have to be true to the promises that we're given. Now, there, there's a couple of ways that we receive promises, as we just said. One is looking through Scripture for those timeless promises that we can hold on to. Another one is through prophetic word in community. God can speak to you or he can speak through others in your lives and give you promises to hold on to. And we have to be discerning with these promises because sometimes people can say something as a blessing and their goal was just to bless you. That's what it was. They wanted to, to be kind to you. We have to be discerning because not everything that is spoken to us in community is uh, a gospel truth principle from Scripture. So the, the, the timeless promises we have in Scripture, hold on to those tightly. The prophetic words that we receive through community and in prayer, hold those loosely. But hold on to both. Those are the places we find our promise. If no word from God ever fails, that means the starting point is on the word of God. What has he spoken to you? If we can't assume on God, we have to then uh, take what he has already given us, his promises. So we start with that point. The second one is that we leave the outcomes to God. If God makes a promise, we have to leave the outcomes to God, how those things work out. Look at the story of Mary. She receives this word from God. She receives the promise through Gabriel that she's going to have a baby. He's going to rule. His, his kingdom is going to have no end. And her question is on the how. How am I going to make this happen? I'm a virgin. I don't get it. There, there's an impossibility here. She can't make it happen. That's why when God gives us a promise, you and I have to leave the outcomes to God. The angel reassures Mary that no word from God will ever fail because God is the one who does it. If God promises it, God will do it. You and I can't make it happen. And even if we could, it won't be good. God is the best. God is the one whose plans are the best. His ways are the best. In the book of Isaiah, we read that his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. If we were to make a promise of God happen, it would very likely not be according to the way God wants it to happen. We have to leave the outcomes to God. The promises of God can't be produced on your and my effort, but only on the effort of God. The God of the impossible is the one who gives the promises and he's the one who does the work. Now that doesn't mean we have no response. That doesn't mean we have no engagement. That doesn't mean we have no effort in the process. It just means that we're not responsible for the outcomes. And one of the main reasons is because we often think the outcomes will look differently than they actually will. But we do have a role to play. We do have a response. And our response is very much like Mary's, and that is to rest in the promise. We have to rest in the promise. If we're leaving the outcomes to God, that's about our effort and our behavior. But resting in the promise of God is about our internal attitude. It's about our perspective toward what's going on. It's Mary looking at everything that has been promised to her, realizing she can't produce the outcomes of that and still have it be the word of God, still have it do what it's supposed to do. And her response is, I am your servant. May it be to me as you've spoken. Mary's role was to rest in the promise, to not panic, to try to figure out how is this going to work out, but just to simply submit herself to God and say, as you will. May it be so in Jesus' name. It's to have a certain level of comfort in 
the promise. I uh, was at a conference uh, earlier last year, and I went forward to be prayed for at the end, and I received a word from somebody, and I, I, I asked for a specific thing, and the word from this person was not at all what I wanted. I don't know if you've ever asked for something and then been immediately disappointed. <laughs> uh, so this person, uh, the, the first thing he said was, you need to stop. Well, that would have been wonderful if I had known what he was talking about. And then he followed that up. He said, he said there's something you need to stop, and you'll know it when you know it. That was about as comforting as it sounds. But I'll tell you what, I knew there was nothing I could literally do about it, so I just started panicking. <laughs> In light of not knowing what to do, I just started descending into a panic spiral and trying to figure out, what the heck am I supposed to stop? There's nothing blatant. I don't have any, like, my, my sin confession is good to go. I'm up to speed on all of those things. Lord, I'll stop anything you want me to stop. Just tell me what you want me to stop. And so I start obsessing about this for weeks. And so I pray about it. Lord, what do you want me to stop? I hear nothing. So I go to my mentor and I'm like, Lord told me to stop something and I don't know what it means. And his response is, dude, Stop. He said you would know, and if you don't know, then just relax. I'm like, oh, okay. I'd received the word from God, and, and I knew there was nothing I could do about it except to rest in his prom promise. No amount of panic, no amount of, of effort was ever going to produce anything. I, I would know when the Lord wants me to know, and that has to be enough. I, I just simply have to say, Okay, I, I'm yours. Whatever you want me to do or, or not do, I'm going to trust that you'll, you'll make me aware of it. I know many people in my life who have received a prophetic word and then let it dictate every element of their life as if they had to produce the outcomes and they were panicked because they couldn't figure it out. When is this going to happen? When is it going to happen? I'll tell you what, if that's your attitude... You are not far from losing not only uh, confidence in everything going on around you, but you're also not far from disillusionment with who God is and walking away from him entirely. That's what effort into our, in, in our effort and our concern into the promises of God gets us. But if we leave the outcomes to God and we rest into his promise, then we get to go along for the ride and see what God wants to do. Every good effort in the world has been from him. Every atrocious deed done in the name of Jesus and in the name of the church throughout history has been from somebody taking the control and concern away from God and trying to make a promise happen. One of the greatest atrocities in the church's history is everything that reflects what went on in the Crusades. People going killing and trying to proselytize, trying to turn people to Jesus in the name of Jesus, in the name of the church. And if they didn't do so, they would kill them or they'd force them into. We have local atrocities around here that were done in the name of Jesus and in the name of the church. And that's people seeing a promise of God in the word of scripture and taking control for the outcomes and not resting into, into his promise. That makes God's impossibility and it takes it away from him and he puts it on us. And that's always a harmful place. It always leads to death and destruction. It always leads to horrible, horrible things. It leads to the opposite of redemption. Only God can redeem your life. Only God can change your story. Only God can heal your needs. That's the claim. And I want to I wanna encourage you, find the promise of the Lord. Search out what he's spoken to you. Get in Jesus-oriented community and find out the promise of God for your life. And trust the outcomes to him and rest into his promise. Friends, I think we need to actually take a word from the immortal words of Paul McCartney. 
That's the appropriate response. He says this, when I find myself in in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me speaking words of wisdom, let it be. And in my hour of darkness, she is standing right in front of me speaking words of wisdom, let it be. That's the heart of rest, no matter our circumstances, reflecting these words of Mary, let it, let it be. In those moments where we need the impossible, stand on the promise of God for you, leave the outcomes to him and let it be. That's our response. That's the faithful response of the church. And when we do that, we become a people of the impossible. A people known for impossible things being done. Not through our own might, not through our own power, but by the creative work of the Spirit of God who is still to this day hovering over the church. Let's pray.